Hello, Kathy Anderson here, a psychology instructor for 11 years and managing associate of supplemental instruction. I want to share some interesting data with you on the biology of love. So when we think about why and how people mate, there are certainly a number of socio-emotional factors to consider. We know that certain traits are universally desirable across cultures and for both sexes when we're choosing a mate. Everyone wants somebody that they love, someone they're attracted to, someone they can depend on, who's emotionally stable, kind, and understanding. But there are two traits that diverge for the sexes. One trait matters much more to men, and one trait matters much more to women. So get this. For men across cultures and time, they place a premium on their female partner being physically attractive. And men, women across cultures and time, place a high value on their male partner being a good provider. And this last fact holds true even now in the United States, where in many major cities, women are out earning men and out earning college degrees and can certainly support themselves. So what gives? Are men jerks who just want a trophy wife? Are women gold diggers who only marry for money? Actually, no. Although, of course, some men and women do behave like that. Can you guess why men want a woman who's physically attractive or why a woman might prefer a man who can provide? I'll give you a hint. Put on your evolutionary hat for a moment and think about it from the perspective of successful reproduction. What might physical beauty be a proxy for? What might it tell a man about her ability to reproduce? Many researchers have concluded that physical beauty of a woman, glossy hair, bright eyes, clear skin, wide hips, and full breasts are in fact a proxy for health. Because carrying a baby to term, delivering it, and nursing it is no easy feat. And wider hips can sometimes help prevent the baby from getting stuck in the birth canal. So no, men aren't just cads. They are evolutionarily wired up to seek a beautiful, healthy woman who can give birth to a baby. What about women? Why might a woman who will spend many years pregnant, vulnerable during childbirth, and then years nursing and caring for children want someone who can provide for her? Maybe it's because she won't have time to go out and kill the buffalo or forage for the wild strawberries. So modern women still do seek a provider even though they can provide for themselves. But did you know that love is actually a distinct neurological system in the brain? Different neurochemicals are present during different stages of love. Do you remember the last time you fell in love? You were high on the emotion of it, right? Full of energy. You could stay up all night talking and not even be tired the next day. That's because your brain was flooded with amphetamines and dopamine. Yes, you heard that right, amphetamine. Not exactly like the meth on the streets, but somewhat similar in its stimulant effects. Boundless energy, happiness, confidence, increased sex drive, loss of appetite. Dopamine, our reward neurotransmitter, keeps us moving relentlessly toward the target of our desire. Sounds exactly like falling in love, doesn't it? The next phase of love is quieter, stronger. It is characterized by strong attachment and commitment. This phase of love is full of oxytocin, often referred to as the cuddle hormone. Oxytocin is released during orgasm, childbirth, and lactation. And it's released whenever we're physically close to the person that we're strongly attached to. Finally, the later years of marriage. Think of the couple married for 50, 60 years, sitting at a restaurant, quietly eating without talking. Have you ever seen a couple like that and felt sad? hope that wouldn't be you someday. I would encourage you to think about that couple differently. They are full of natural opioids, which promote long-term commitment and tranquility. And when I say opioids, you may be thinking Vicodin or morphine are strong pain relievers. And you'd be right. This couple is pleasantly floating along on opioids, no longer fueled by the amphetamines that decades earlier kept them up all night talking. Monogamy, too, is helped along by the biological goings-on in the brain. Let's look at some data. First, women who are more strongly bonded to their boyfriends are less able to identify another man's body odor. So take the woman's boyfriend's unwashed t-shirt and a bunch of other men's t-shirts as well and have her smell them. She will probably be able to pick out her boyfriends, but won't be able to tell a difference among the rest of them. 
Researchers think her attention is being deflected from other men toward him, promoting monogamy. Second, men also have oxytocin, and it seems to make them find their partners more attractive than they really are, again, promoting monogamy. So other people might rate her a six, but he will genuinely rate her an eight. And finally, oxytocin also causes men to be slightly hostile toward other women, again, promoting monogamy. Now, let's consider a novel biological influence on reproduction, the birth control pill. Does anyone know when the birth control pill first became widely available? It was actually 1960 at the start of the sexual revolution. And do you know how the birth control pill prevents pregnancy? Many people don't. It actually prevents ovulation by preventing the release of an egg from the ovary. No egg, no baby. Now, let's consider a few facts. First, ovulating women prefer masculine men. That is, they prefer men who show dominance and competitiveness. Ovulating women like their men manly. Second, ovulating women prefer men who are genetically dissimilar to themselves. This is a good thing, right? You've heard about people who inbreed with their cousins and how their children are often born with physical and mental abnormalities. Third, men seem to detect women's fertility status and prefer women who are ovulating. So with 15% of women in the U.S. on the birth control pill and not ovulating, that may be influencing them to seek out less masculine men, men who are not a good genetic mate uh, with them, and they may be less attractive to men generally. Quite a conundrum. All right, y'all, that wraps it up for today on the biology of love. I hope you learned some interesting tidbits to share around the dinner table tonight. Nothing kicks off a great conversation like, hey, did you hear about the study on men's dirty t-shirts and monogamy? 